Up next, a long-ranging conversation with one of the true kings of 70s rock radio. He had the biggest album of the time using unique technology. Tells us about his friendship with George Harrison and how he created one of the classic rock staples, a yacht rock classic as well, of the 70s. It's next on Professor of Rock, brought to you by Zenny. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Subscribe below to be a part of a community that is dedicated to the all-time classics of music, the stories behind the songs, and the artists. Now, I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where, of course, featured artists go very deep into their greatest songs. On this installment of Revelations, man, so honored to present episode one of our recent Zoom session with Peter Frampton. As he goes in-depth on one of the biggest blockbuster albums ever, Frampton Comes Alive. Peter has his memoirs out right now, and you should read them. The book is called Do You Feel Like I Do? It's out now. We'll have a link below where you can get it. Peter will give some insight on the book here as well in the interview. As I get into the interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, which is the brand that I'm wearing. It's my favorite pair of glasses I've ever worn. See for yourself. You can design your own pair, have them shipped right to your door. Here's Peter. I'd been down to Nassau, Bahamas. I went down there for three weeks to write. We, I had three weeks to write the whole album. That's when I had a bit of a swim. Uh, <laughs> I went, had some lunch. I went outside. About four o'clock, I guess I started fiddling around again on my acoustic. And I came up with the opening chords to Baby, I Love Your Way. You know, I was thinking about Penny that day and I, she was in New York and I was I was in the Bahamas. And um, in those days, it wasn't as easy to just get on the phone, no mobile phones or whatever. you got to get long distance and all that. And, and um, uh, so it, it was difficult to, to, to communicate. And um, so it was just basically a, a love note to her, really, that, um, you know, I was wondering how she was feeling and, and I couldn't I couldn't get an answer, you know. So it was I was just a, a song that I wrote for her, basically. Now, it was a single from your first self-titled album in 75. And like you said, you have a swim, you had some lunch, and then you sent her that palm tree. That, that was it, you know. And um, by about 4.35, the sun has started to, to sink, and, and the shadows are moving across the page. And so that's how I wrote the lyrics. <laughs> it's just, I just wrote what I saw. Shadows grow so long. I remember when I came back uh, from uh, Nassau, I went to see Alvin Lee and his wife, who who I'd spent time with before I wrote that song. And um, so I remember his wife at the time, Suzanne said, um, oh, what did you, did you write anything finally? And so I, I got out, I got uh, one of Alvin's acoustics and I just started playing um, like the first verse and chorus of Baby, I Love Your Way. And so I said, well, I, what do you, you know, I had no idea, you know, what do you think about this one? And she was just like, oh, my goodness, that's really good. I said, you're kidding. Really? You like it? And so that was my first test to see if that song was as powerful as I thought it could be. Because I did feel, um, uh, and then the other time was we were recording that song in this castle in in Wales, and uh, Clearwell Castle, and um, John Siomis, the drummer, was down in the basement, and I was in a bathroom with the acoustic. We were all over the place. Whichever room sounded good for the instrument, that's where you were, you know. And we just joined up on headphones, and um, so I'm going. We just finished the song, and I'm going, so John, John, I really, I John, and then he put his hand, he'd come all the way upstairs, and he just put his hand on my child, <laughs> and I turn around, and go, John goes, and he said, that's one of the best songs I've ever heard. I said, you're kidding me. 
He said, yeah, man, you've written a really great song. So that was the second. My own band were now telling me. So I had no idea, you know. Uh, I just knew I liked it, and um, I thought it was a good song, you know. Had no idea of its the power of that song. The Fireflies, where where did that come from? Well, that's, that's all um, as... Um, as the sun goes down, um, uh, the fireflies come out, you know, when you're sitting outside underneath that palm tree. I had never seen fireflies before. Um, and um, so this was like um, looking out and seeing people lighting their cig cigarette lighters in the old days, you know, one over here, one over there. You know, and um, I would just, you know, because you can't really see them and then you just see the light come on, and, you know, so that had to be in the song. You know, it was all part of the ambiance of of the feeling that I had. I'm alone. It's I'm hearing the crickets and I'm seeing the uh, the fireflies and the sun setting. It was just uh, writing about the moment. Such great imagery, just poetry. I love it. Thank you. Baby, I Love Your Way is one of those songs that has become so much bigger over time than its chart peak position. It's one of the most popular classic rock ballads of all time. And you know, it went to number 12 in the Billboard Hot 100 at the time and number three in Canada and number eight in Brazil. But it's just become so massive. And then to have people redo your songs, what I used to love is Casey Kasem, the American Top 40, he would always harken back to the original. I remember when Will to Power hit number one. Right with really that mashup, Baby, I Love Your Way, and Freebird. Will the Power hit number one in 88. Ooh, baby, it was cool to hear that song. I'd heard it growing up. Now, when Will the Power did it, though, they actually hadn't reached out to you or worked out a deal with your publisher, as I understand it. Well, it was a, a strange situation all around, really, because... Um, uh, my um, sister-in-law at the time, Carol, was down in Florida on vacation mm -hmm. and in Miami. And she, she called me and she said, uh, I, I'm, I'm hearing your song on the radio down here and it's on all the time, but it's not you. And I said, well, what's that will to power? No, no, it's not the medley one. It's not the one with Freebird. She said, it's something else. So I called up um, management and, and my publisher and I said, is this, this, I think this song is out, you know, um, and um, I knew nothing about it. And they said, well, we don't know anything about it either. I said, you're kidding me. Because uh, if you're going to cover someone's song, you don't have to ask the artist, but you have to ask the publisher because uh, they, they'll do a deal with you for that particular cover song. Sure. And then they called um, Leonard Skinner's publisher and said, have they called you? And they said, no. And they didn't know about it either. Wow. Usually what would happen is that if, if I was to do a medley of two songs by two different artists, I would call their publishers and they would both say, well, there's two songs in one song. Okay. So each song takes 50-50, you know, it's 50-50, okay? Um, no problem. Well, because they didn't uh, do a deal with the publisher, the publisher said, well, we're going to charge 100% each. So unfortunately, it wasn't a great move to not call them. <laughs> so, uh, so Great negotiating was, position for, you, for the publisher. Yeah, well, it was, it was a business thing. I had nothing to do with that because... Uh, the publishers dealt with that, so it was something they felt they needed to do, and they went went ahead and did did that. So well, it shows the power of the song that it resonates again, introduced a whole new generation, and then of course later with Big Mountain's reggae remake in '93. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, that's only five years later. I know. <laughs> number six on the Billboard charts, and number two in the UK. Yeah. 
just incredible to have 70s, 80s, 90s coverage on all three of those decades. I know. It was, uh, that was a real surprise. I was actually recording um, with uh, Chris Lord Algae um, at the time, and Tom Lord Algae, his brother, is, is another engineer, and he was working on the track of, well, of um, Big Mountain. So I heard them that they were doing it. The producer of, of the Big Mountain track um, said, came to me and said, look, your song is, is on the radio uh, in, a, in a car in a scene in this movie, Reality Bites. I can't believe you don't remember Frampton Comes Alive. That album like totally changed my life. So we were wondering if, if you would like to do, redo it as reg, a reggae version we, we feel would be good. And I said, I've done that song so many different ways. I said, I, I, I don't think I can do it again. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, I'm thrilled that it's on the radio, in the car, in the movie. I don't really want to do it reggae, um, but feel free. <laughs> so I said, well, I do have somebody. I said, I thought you might. Um, he said, I, <laughs> I um, this, this act, um, Big Mountain, we'd like to, so do I have your blessing? I said, absolutely, go ahead. And of course, when, when I heard the version, that's my favorite cover of Baby I Love You Way that's, you know, by somebody else. I think it's a phenomenal pop song. Uh, For pop sure. Arrange, uh, the production, it's, it's a great Great production of that song. Ooh, baby, I love you way, every day. You feel like I do. Full of great stories, honest insight. I think what I appreciated most was how open you were in sharing the low points as well as elaborating on the highs. I think that's always a great rock biography instead of just the everything's great world that we live in of, of social media where we're putting up this facade. And I love that not afraid to be vulnerable and reveal your most personal feelings at pivotal moments in your life. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about the book as far as getting people to read it. I love the recounting of your dismay about the Rolling Stone magazine cover. I don't think we should cover that because I think right, that's right. a calling card for people to read because that's right. a very interesting part. Questionable navigation from your management, your embarrassment surrounding Sergeant Pepper, the Sergeant Pepper film. All that is so fascinating. I couldn't put the book down myself. Well, thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's it's life. You know, it's uh, there is no uh, creative cre career uh, that it has, has reached a success level. Um, really, I don't think that's ever been a straight line graph all the way up or straight across, always successful. People have their ups and downs. You can't, as um, I read Chronicles uh, 1 by Bob Dylan, and, and, and I, I, I quote his, his quote in the book in, in, in as much as he, I was so thrilled to read that Bob Dylan said that there were a couple of years there where he had, he thought he had writer's block. He couldn't write. And then at a specific moment, it, he can't remember, you know, what brought it on or whatever. He just got this urge to write his write lyrics, and he just got his legal pad out and started writing, writing, writing. And he said he wrote like twenty different pieces, you know, in ten days or something. And he put them in the drawer, closed the drawer, and he said, "There's my next album, basically." And he said, "What it, what that made him realize." was that you don't have writer's block, but you're on input. You can't always be on output. You have to have time to take in inspiration. You know, I just thought that was such a great way of putting it. It really and, is. Um, you know, that all of a sudden he's now, for some reason, he's in output. And you can never say when that's going to be. Well, as an artist, you beat yourself up over that. Like, why am I not but realizing that and connecting with that? That's huge. Yeah, it is. But at the time, you're always thinking, oh, God, I, I can't write. I can't. Well, if that's the case, don't fret over it. Do something else. 
Because well, don't it's force trying yourself. To come back. Yeah, right? exactly. Go live a little. <laughs> yeah. You know. Because your best work could come out from that. Yes. Um, so I thank Bob Dylan for cluing me in on that one. And and I think that in the book, it's there's a lot of funny things that, and I don't tell jokes. I just tell what happened. And everybody's life is funny, uh, thrilling, sad. It, every We cover, as humans, we go through every emotion, you know, and uh, through our lives and through our days. <laughs> and and um, I just think that, um, you know, the, the book just covers that in a way. I don't hold back on the down side because I think it's important for people to know, you know, that I wasn't just sitting on my laurels counting my money. When you read the book, you'll see there was a lot of time when there wasn't any money, you know. So, and um, so, why write a book if you're not going to tell the reason behind why the next good thing did happen? Because, um, you know, you had to go through, like I say, you never stop paying your dues. After Frampton Comes Alive hit, I thought the money's never going to stop rolling in. And I, my success is never going to, st- this is, I'm just the almighty, you know. As you couldn't be so, r- more wrong if you try. Right. You know, that's not the way. And you learn that very quickly, you know. No, that's what I love about the book. And the other thing about the book that I've always loved, that I loved is that you, you have deep friendships with, with so many luminaries over your career. Not only David Bowie, who we talked about, but Harry Nilsson, and George Harrison, Billy Preston. And these are a lot of these people are are past and gone. And so I think it's great to be able to. And when we get back together, I would love to talk about that. And also Stevie Wonder, oh. how he played harmonica on the B side. Yeah. Yes. To Sign Sealed. I mean, just incredible. But we'll talk about that when you have some time down the road. But man, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Such a thrill to be able to to read this book and tell you how much I appreciate and we appreciate the music, the wonderful music that you've given us. Like I said, it's a touchstone that brings me closer to my own father uh, now that he's gone because of those memories. So I just really, really love it. Hey, thank you so much, Peter. You're very welcome. And thank you for having me on your show. Thank you so much for watching. To get more of this interview and many others, click on our Patreon link. Leave us a comment about Peter Frampton, the song, the album. What are your memories? You can get Peter's brand new book at the link below. Make sure to do that. If this content resonates with you, we invite you to subscribe to join our community to help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends.